So now we are going to go to the final section for today's topic and it's to talk about food pyramids. So we have already described what is an ecosystem. We have looked at energy flow through an ecosystem. We have looked at food chains and the food webs. And now we are looking at food pyramids which include pyramids of numbers, pyramids of biomass, and pyramids of energy. A food pyramid shows the relative sizes of different components of the various trophic levels of a food chain. There are three types of ecological pyramids. We have pyramids of numbers, biomass, and energy. In a food pyramid, each trophic level in a food chain is represented by a horizontal bar with the width of the bar representing the number of organisms or the amount of biomass or the amount of energy available at that trophic level. The base of the pyramid represents the producer, the second level is the primary consumer and so on. So this is a pyramid, there are horizontal bars here representing each trophic level. This is the first trophic level where we have our producers and it is the widest one. And next level would be our herbivores and they are going to be the second widest. And then as we go up, we will have less of the organisms so that the, the width will be decreasing as you go up the food chain and as you go up the pyramid and hence it comes out having this pyramidal shape and hence the name why they call it pyramids. Now there are three type of pyramids that you can try to construct. And we will learn that some pyramids are better than others. For example, the pyramid of numbers is not the best one to try to draw because it's not going to always come out giving us this nice pyramidal shape. Sometimes it's going to come out looking like a lopsided pyramid. And for this reason, it's not often used. So a pyramid of numbers shows the relative number of organisms at each stage of a food chain. For example, in this food chain here where the snail eats the clover, the thrush eats the snail, the hawk eats the thrush. The clover is a plant, and so it's at the first trophic level, and it is a producer in the food chain. Its bar will go to the bottom of the pyramid. Then um, the snail consumes the clover, and the thrush consumes the snail, and the hawk consumes the thrush. Now, we expect the producers should be the largest ones in number. The snail would be the next largest in number, but as you go up, we notice that the width is getting smaller and smaller, which is basically saying to us that the numbers of organisms are getting less and less the higher up we go in the food chain. Now, energy is lost to the surroundings as we go from one level to the next. So there are fewer organisms at each level in this food chain. A lot of clover is needed to support the small snail population. A thrush eats lots of snails and hawk eats lots of thrushes. So the population of hawks is very small. Other pyramidal shapes now. Sometimes a pyramid of numbers does not look like a pyramid at all. This could happen if the producer is a large plant, such as a tree, or if one of the animals is very small. Remember, though, that whatever the situation, the producer still goes to the bottom of the pyramid. Here is, here is an example of a lopsided pyramid of numbers. The oak tree is a large producer to the bottom, but it's only one tree. That's why it is so narrow. Even though the tree is huge, we, only, we are only counting how many trees there are. So that's why we we'll only have one oak tree, and that's why the width is very narrow. Then we are many insects living in this oak tree, feeding on it. So that's why the width of the insects is larger than the width of the oak tree. And then we have the woodpecker eating the insects. And that's smaller than the, um, the insect line because you, would, you definitely would have more insects than woodpeckers because woodpeckers have to eat multiple insects for the day. So this is a lopsided pyramid because we had one large producer. Here's another example of one that doesn't shape. Um, it doesn't have the, the regular pyramidal shape that you would expect. Here we have grass. To the bottom so we have a lot of grass trees so that's why it's so wide then we have the rabbit consuming the grass now we have the fleas consuming the rabbits now the fleas are small so you can have multiple fleas living on one rabbit and that is why the width of the flea bar is greater than that of the rabbit all right so pyramids of energy can come out looking like a nice pyramid as we saw in this case the first one but then it can be lopsided when we have one large um, producer and then it can also have variant shapes. For example, when we have small organisms like these parasites feeding on others. The next type of pyramid we can have is known as a pyramid of biomass. 
And it says that sometimes a pyramid of numbers is not the best way to represent a food chain. In this case, a pyramid of biomass, which is the dry mass of an organism, is a better diagram to use. It shows the total mass of organisms at each stage of the food chain. In general, all producers have a higher biomass than the primary consumer, so a pyramid will always be produced. If you are using a pyramid of biomass, you're always going to get a nice pyramid shape because there's no way that the organisms in a trophic level can have more biomass than the trophic level that it feeds on. So you'll always have a, a, a nice pyramid shape. But there is a disadvantage though for using the pyramid of biomass because this pyramid here requires the dry mass of the organism. And for you to get the dry mass of the organism, you have to kill the organism, put it in an oven and dry out all the water in that organism and then get the mass, which is the dry mass. So if you are trying to construct a pyramid of biomass, it means that you would have to kill the organisms that you have collected in order to get this data. So that is one of the main disadvantages of this pyramid, even though it gives very good information. So it says that the total energy and biomass present at the lower tier of the pyramid must be greater than the higher tiers in order to support the energy requirements of the subsequent organisms. So for example, here is a food pyramid. A uh, pyramid that was done first with a pyramid of numbers and it came out lopsided, the one that we saw before with the oak tree. So we have one oak tree, many caterpillars feeding on the one oak tree. So the caterpillar um, bar is wider than the oak tree. The blue tit feeds on the caterpillars and it's narrower than the caterpillar. And the sparrow feeds on the blue tit, which is now narrow. Now it's lopsided because we had one large producer. Now if we had taken this very same food chain and used and constructed a pyramid of biomass instead, you would have noticed that it comes out back to give us the nice pyramidal shape because the oak tree would have killed it and dry, um, dried out the water and then taken the biomass and it would have been a greater biomass than the biomass of the caterpillars. So even though there were more caterpillars there, the biomass of the caterpillar is they are still lower than the, that of the oak tree and the blue tit is less and so on. So it, this one, the biomass gives us that nice pyramidal shape. But remember, as I said, the organisms have to be killed for you to construct this pyramid, and that is one of the disadvantages. Now, the final type, which is one of the best pyramids to draw, will be the pyramid of energy. Always will give us a nice pyramidal shape. So the pyramid of energy shows the amount of energy trapped per unit time and area at each stage of a food chain. For example, in this case, we have a pyramid of energy where the producers had 1,000 kilocalories of energy. And by the time we get up to the tertiary consumer, it has one kilocal of energy. Now, a normal shaped pyramid is always produced because there is a reduced amount of energy at each successive trophic level. In terms of energy, there is an increased efficiency in supplying green plants as human food and a relative inefficiency in feeding crop plants to animals. So this is just showing you why it is, um, if you consider how energy is transferred, you can see that it's, we get more energy when we eat plants, if we could actually digest the cellulose than when you eat other um, organisms. For example, here it is that the sun supplies 100 calories and the these look like flowers or plants. They capture two calories and we get 0 0.2 calories if we were to eat the plants. But I think this is if we could digest the cellulose, but we can't. And the cows, they are herbivores and cows are large. They are large in size, right? And they only eat grass, but the grass is very um, energy dense. And the cows are harvesting a lot of energy by being herbivores. And that's why they can get these large um, masses that they have. If you look at most of the animals who are herbivores, they are big animals. The cows, the elephants, the giraffes, amongst the biggest animals on land, they are herbivores because by eating green plants, they are able to capture more energy than if they were carnivores, right? So if we humans were to eat the cow, we would only get 0 0.02 calories per gram from the cow versus if we ate the green plant directly, we would have gotten 0 0.2 calories, right? So short food chains are more efficient than long ones in providing energy to the top consumer. Below are two food chains and energy values for each level in them. Both food chains have a human being as a top consumer. 10 times more energy is available to the human in the second food chain than in the first because it was shorter. 
In the second food chain, the human is a herbivore or a vegetarian, but eating parts of a cow provide humans with other nutrients as well as we can gain energy from the cow. It would be very difficult to persuade everyone to become vegetarian for the sake of energy efficiency. And so they're basically saying that even though we don't have the cellulase enzyme to digest the, um, all the cellulose in the, in the producer, we still get more energy by eating the vegetables than we do from eating the meat, essentially. But when you're eating food, you're not only eating so that you can get energy, you're eating so that you can also get the correct amount of macronutrients and micronutrients. So if you are going to consume only um, plants, then you will get your energy requirement, but you might not get enough macro and micronutrients. And so even if you're planning to be a vegetarian, you have to make sure that you consume enough protein, etc., by probably using supplements or eating a lot of um, legumes, peas, etc., to ensure that you are getting all your nutrients in addition to getting all your energy. But they're basically saying a vegetarian, by eating plant-based foods, will get enough energy from that because they are eating the producer directly instead of waiting to eat the meat, right? And, and as the further up you go in the food chain, the lower the amount of energy you're actually getting from your food. So 10 times more energy is available to the human in the second food chain than in the first. In the second food chain, the human is a herbivore or a vegetarian, but eating parts of a cow provide humans with other nutrients as well as those we gain energy from. It would be very difficult to persuade everyone to become vegetarian for the sake of energy deficiency. Energy efficiency, sorry. So, alternative one feeds 10 people. Alternative two feeds 100 people. Some farmers try to maximize meat production by reducing movement of their animals. So they keep them in pens or cages with a food supply and keep them warm in the winter. And this means that less stored energy is wasted by the animals. So that's a very smart thing. If you know that a lot of the energy from an animal is going to be lost with maintaining their body temperature or lost with movement, then if you minimize that energy loss, the animal will store more energy and will have greater sizes, etc. So why do food chains usually have fewer than five trophic levels? This is because of the energy um, inefficiency. As the energy is passed along the food chain, each organism uses some of it. So the further along the chain you go, the less energy there is. The loss of energy along the food chain limits the length of it. There are really more than five links in a chain because there is not enough energy left to supply another link. Many food chains only have three links. So basically they're saying, if you had a food chain in which the lion was the top of that food chain, and if you were thinking, why isn't there something that consumes the lion and then is at a higher level than the lion? Now the reason for why you don't have anything higher than the lion is because of that low energy transfer that takes place. For if there was an animal who could survive by eating lions, then that animal would have to consume more than one lion's possibly for the day. And that is not easy for them to hunt down two lions per day because there are not many lions around the place, right? So that would be challenging. So that's where we'll stop for this um, food pyramids. And I will message you the questions that are to be done on this topic.